Hey pals, quick note before we get started. This is number two of three of our reruns from season four. You knew there was no way we would get through this rerun series without including an episode that isn't the most popular. It was a really tough choice for us to go through all the potential picks like Amen Send Money, The Callous of October, Missing Hours. There was lots to choose from. But an easy favorite of your Go With The Heat crew is The Big Thaw. We had so much fun with this episode, and it really was nice to get early in the season a fun episode from Miami Vice. And no matter what, we will always know that somewhere out there is a Rastafarian popsicle floating in the Atlantic Ocean. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And, and this is your cultural guy, Dominic, that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 4, Episode 4, titled The Big Thaw. We should have known what was coming based on the name of this episode. Not only was it titled The Big Thaw, but they delivered on a popsicle in the <laughs> very beginning. <laughs> yes. It originally premiered on October 23rd, 1987. It is written by Joseph de Blasi. Hold on a second. That's not his real name. He wrote under the pseudonym for just this episode. So it comes off as like he didn't want to put his name on this episode. I don't know why. I mean, <laughs> why would that be? Why? <laughs> this seems to be a trend. It's like no writers wanted to be no. It, it was like that job for writers uh, or directors where it was bottom bin, you know. <laughs> I'll write it, but I don't want to put my name on it. I don't want anyone to know I was associated with you guys. But I need the money, so. <laughs> I will take your money. <laughs> His real name is Michael Duggan. Now, we've seen Michael Duggan a bunch already. He wrote Baby Blues, Lend Me an Ear, Knock Knock, Who's There, Viking Bikers from Hell. He's also the story editor for seasons three and four and wrote a ton of the teleplay. So he translates the script into what they read on set and the story editor. And for some reason, he's done all that work, including Viking Bikers from Hell. And he's like, I'm not putting my name on this one. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that should be fine right there. (laughs) Yeah, watch this one. I was like, nope, not doing it. It is directed by Richard Compton, who also directed Down for the Count Part 1 and 2. Everybody's in showbiz. He's still got four more episodes coming. So that's the thing. <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Before we get started, we can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, we've got to make a quick announcement. We are going to be off next week. And again, this is because of me. Every time we seem to be off, it's because of something that I have done or I'm going to be doing. We're going to be off next week because I'm going to be on the road doing work nine to five work stuff instead of podcasting stuff. So we're going to take the week off. I just won't have time to get everything that needs to be done to get this show made. But we'd love to hear from you. Email me, go with the at gmail.com. Let me know when we have these weeks off. Do you prefer no episode or classic episode? Like put one of our previous episodes into the feed. That way you'll see it pop in there. Let me know what you think on that. Go with the heat at gmail.com, twitter.com slash go with the heat. Facebook.com slash go with the heat. Love to hear what, what your thoughts are on that and what we should do when we're off for a week. Now, it's just one week. We'll be back the week after. All right, John, we got a couple of people I don't know anything about and really couldn't find any information about. And then also Bob Marley. So <laughs> <laughs> what do you got for us? I had a little bit. I had a little bit more luck. It's definitely a reggae theme. We did get a little bit of some salsa type music, but mostly reggae. So obviously we have Bob Marley and we're going to spend some time talking about him. Let's talk about the other two first. Get those out of the way. We have What is Life by Black Uhuru, which is a Jamaican reggae group formed in 1972. The group went through a number of lineup changes over the years with Derek Ducky Simpson being the mainstay. So they saw their success mostly during the 80s with the album Anthem. In 1985, they actually won a be- uh, gra- uh, Grammy for best reggae album they and they've had some used in like video games like they had their song great train robbery used in grand theft auto san andreas they had a song used in scarface the video game they were formed in kingston in 72 initially called the black sounds of uru 
through being a Swahili word for freedom, throw out a name of a nice favorite. They worked extensively with Sly and Robbie, who we had in our music before. They recorded oh. a string of successful singles, and that was kind of the start to their climb to success. By the end of the 80s, things kind of started to fizzle out. They stopped working with Sly and Robbie. Sandra Jones, who had joined the band during their popularity, left the band because of cancer diagnosis. She would eventually die of cancer in 1990. Her replacement would leave almost immediately after being denied a U.S. visa. She was unable to tour, and it, it eventually whittled all the way down to just Simpson himself. So he was coincidentally, at that point, booked to play an awards show in California that also was featuring several of the original members of Black Uru. It would reunite from 91 to 96 until the band would break up after Simpson would sue Don and Garth because they started touring in the U.S. under the name without, that, without Simpson. So Simpson eventually won the lawsuit in 97 and pretty much continues to to tour under that name. And just like every couple of years, he just remakes the band. There's still just all kinds of turnover with who, who's in the band. It's pretty much Simpson's deal. Our next song is My Vieja by Fernando Echevarria y la Familia Andres. I... John, I always appreciate your pronunciation of Spanish, especially when you put the little flair on it. I love it. <laughs> I try. <laughs> I, I really try. This is going to be kind of interesting. This is kind of our intermission in our music because a lot of times I come across these where these guys weren't a band very long. There's not a lot of information on the web about them. This is based off of their album, A More, A More. In 1987, it was pretty much one of the main and kind of like big things. They one of the only successful albums they did, from what I can tell. Uh, maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know that much about this, but what I do know is that depending on what biography you look at, Fernando Echevarria, there's a, some discrepancies. He's a <laughs> singer songwriter from Santa Domingo, Dominican Republic. And was possibly born August 14th, 1953. Possibly. <laughs> well, at the same time. At, well, hold on. At On September 5th, 1953, less than a month later, a Chilean businessman, so named Fernando Echevarri, was also born. I do not know if they were one and the same. Both be 64 <laughs> today. <laughs> but I also read a biography that said that he was born not in 53, but in December 7th, 1952. And apparently he died in 2015. Mm, unfortunately. So depending on who you can't believe. Ask him. Yes. Depending <laughs> on who you believe, he is either alive, a Chilean businessman, or he is dead. <laughs> Maybe he's frozen floating <laughs> through the ocean. <laughs> I will say the one that claims he is dead, I, I, I kind of put the most behind because I actually had some more information. He claimed that he, uh, prior to taking up music, he graduated as an architect and worked in creative advertising. He was widely considered the father of fusion. He won national awards with La Familia Andreas and international awards. And he had moved to Miami in 2012, eventually settled back in San D Domingo. And while preparing to go on stage in San Domingo on October 11th, 2015, he suffered a massive heart attack. Mm. Now, I would believe that, but the news source attached to it that they provided was a Fox News <laughs> news <laughs> clip. So, I mean, just kind of take it... <laughs> As you will. <laughs> so let's talk about who actually came here to talk about. Let's talk about Bob Marley. Songs Wings of a Dove and Wake Up and Live are featured in this episode. Bob Marley, the iconic Jamaican singer-songwriter, was born February 6th, 1945, and... Unfortunately, passed away May 11th, 1981. And I mean, just international and cultural icon, famous for songs like No Woman, No Cry, One Love, Buffalo Soldiers, I Shot the Sheriff, Go Tell It on the Mountaintop. I mean, just so much, 
So we're gonna just run through a little bit of of the history of him. I'm going to I'm gonna try and summarize it quickly. So if I leave some stuff out, it's it's not intentional. It's just so I don't bore you to death because I could go on for about two pages worth. His full name is Robert Nesta Marley Marley and Newville Livingston, later known as Bunny Whaler, were actually childhood friends growing up in Nine Mile in Jamaica. They actually began playing together as far back as junior high would eventually get a place together in Trenchtown where they would join a vocal group with some a local musician, Joe Higgs, who was already part of a somewhat successful group called Higgs and Wilson. Higgs would help develop Marley's vocals and actually teach him how to play guitar. In 1963, Marley, Bunny Whaler, Peter Tosh, Junior Braithwaite, Beverly Kelso, and Cherry Smith formed the Teenagers. The Teenagers would become the Wailing Rude Boys. The Wailing Root Boys would become the Wailing Whalers, who would be <laughs> discovered by record producer uh, Coxon Dodd. They would become just the Whalers because all of those other names were silly. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I wish they could just continue to go on forever, <laughs> coming up a variation of something whaling. <laughs> yes, yes. So they would record a sing. They would record the single "Simmer Down," which would become number one in Jamaica on February 1974. They would go on from there to start performing regularly with other reggae and recording with other reggae artists. And by 1966, Braithwaite, also and Smith would leave the band, leaving just Marley, Whaler, and Tosh. Also in 66, Marley would marry Rita Anderson. He would move to the United States briefly to live near his mom in, of all places, Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he, yes, Delaware. Think, think Bob Marley and think, like, where would you least expect him to live? <laughs> Delaware. I'm actually constantly surprised that people he, live in Delaware. <laughs> I've gone years without thinking about yes. Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> I forget. It's a state. Sorry, people from Delaware. <laughs> so while living in Delaware for a short time, he worked at a DuPont lab as a lab assistant. And he also worked on the line at a Chrysler plant. Under the alias Donald Marley. <laughs> Why? I have no idea. <laughs> so he would then move back to Jamaica and get really interested in, Rast uh, in Rastafarian beliefs. He would convert and start growing his famous dreadlocks. And then after a financial disagreement with Todd, he would move on to working first with Lee Scratch Perry and the Upsetters. Another fantastic name. <laughs> <laughs> and then Leslie Kong, who Leslie Kong is one of the four major develop uh, developers of the reggae sound. At least that's like musically. He's one of the four like big producers that brought reggae to the forefront in the 70s. So from 60, 68 to 72, they recut some old demos, but uh, nothing really worth releasing. And then 72 to 74, they moved to Island Records. Pretty much, and replacing another Vice musical guest, Jimmy Cliff. Mm. They would release Catch Fire in 73, their first album that would be released worldwide. And they would actually package it uniquely, almost like a, a, like a rock record, where they package it like a Zippo lighter with a lift top. Pretty cool. Uh, initially, it only sold, sold 14,000 records, though it got positive reception. And the following year allowed them to release Burning, which featured the song I Shot the Sheriff. So, funny story. Eric Clapton's guitarist, George Terry, gifted him the album, and he liked it. Liked it so much when he heard the song I Shot the Sheriff that he covered it. And this is two years, uh, I believe, two years after the release. And it would be Clapton's first U.S. hit since Layla. Marley and the Whalers would be seeing so much success with Island that Island founder and their producer, Chris Blackwell, would gift Marley his Kingston estate, which also came with a studio, which he would name Tough Gong Studio, because the names are just fantastic in this biography. <laughs> They would go on to be scheduled to open 17 shows for Sly and the Family Stone, but would be fired after only opening the first couple because they were, and I love this line, and this is what I love about Wikipedia, is that you can sense the bias in people's <laughs> biographies. 
They were fired because they were popular than the acts they were opening for. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's how that works. They dis- yeah, I don't think that's how it works either. So, But they disbanded in 74. Marley continued to perform as Bob Marley and the Wailers, but with a different lineup, not including Bunny Whaler. So, odd. <laughs> 1975, they would release Natty Dread, which would feature No Woman, No Cry, followed by Rasta Vibration in 76, which would lead them with a top 50 billboard on their soul charts. In 76, they though, in two days before a free concert, to try and ease tensions between warring political parties, Marley, his wife, and his manager were attacked in his home by a gunman and wounded. And actually, his wife and his manager were wounded pretty severely. Everyone would end up recovering, and Marley would still perform the concert, even though several of the whalers would, would actually be in hiding from threats. Damn. So after being attacked, Marley from Se- uh, would leave Jamaica. He would set, he would take a stint in the Bahamas, recovering and writing, and then would spend the next two years in what he, what would be self-imposed exile, living in London. Where he would record two more albums, these ones containing his hits Jammin', One Love, Ultimately, under the name Bob Marley and the Whalers, he would release 11 albums. 1980s Rising would be his final studio album, and actually his most religious album, featuring a redemption song, and actually wouldn't be released until 83, actually after he had already passed away. It also included the unreleased Buffalo Soldier, which is actually one of his most popular songs posthumously. We're getting around toward the end. In 1977, Marley was found to have a type of malignant meloma under one of his toenails on on his toe. And rather than having his toe amputated, he elected to just have the nail removed and the nail bed removed so that when affect his mobility, he could continue touring and he enjoyed playing soccer and jogging. He was actually in pretty good shape for a pothead. (laughs) So he would continue touring, um, though he would still be, uh, he would still be kind of sick, kind of battling illness while he toured. In fact, he would undertake a world tour in 1980 which would feature a concert in Milan with over a thousand people in the audience, which would be his biggest show to date. He would go from that tour to a U.S. tour where he would do two shows in New York at Madison Square Garden. During this time, he collapsed during a jogging tour of Central Park. And after taken to a hospital, he would learn that the cancer actually never went away and it had now spread to his brain. So, and it actually got quick after that. So two Damn. days later, he was playing his la- what would be his last show in Pittsburgh on September 23rd, 1980. Shortly after that show, he would learn that the cancer had spread throughout his entire body, can- canceled the rest of the tour, and as his health began to quickly decline, he would seek treatment at a Bavarian clinic uh, that, fi- that specialized in alternative medicine. After eight months without any real success of the treatments, he decided he was going to return home for the last his last days. But on his trip home from Germany to Jamaica, they would he would have to be hospitalized in Miami, where he would have actually eventually pass away May eleventh, nineteen eighty one. Tragic ending to a just massively iconic career, and once again. Just some of the most fantastic names in, in the history of biographies. So hey, you know, John, I said that I was hoping that this music would make more sense, and you had someone in there where you're like, I don't know, he might be a businessman. <laughs> we don't know. Person. We don't know. So there's still yeah. mystery in the music. By the way, if you're a Chilean businessman and you were in the and you performed with La Family Andreas, please contact the show and let us know that you are still alive. <laughs> We may have told people the wrong information. Yes, yes. Don't blame us, though. This is all Fox's new, Fox News' fault. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. I don't know how to feel. So let's go talk this one out. <laughs> Well, that is going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. And you know what? For the first time, Go With The Heat and Miami Vice, they match. 
we're all just trying to have a whole bunch of fun, poke some jokes at some things that were happening in the late 80s. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Tweet at us at go with the heat. Get us on Facebook, facebook.com slash go with the heat. Let us know what you think of this episode and what you think of Fun Vice when they just, you know what, throw caution to the wind. Let's just have a silly story and do silly stuff. Let's call people waffle heads and have a freezer tube floating with a Rastafarian <laughs> popsicle across the Atlantic Ocean. Let's just go for it. Yes. So what do you think of these episodes? Let us know. Email us at the heat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out the website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe, including tune in, YouTube. If you like to watch the show or say have it playing on your TV while you do stuff around the house, we got you. Go to YouTube.com. You can search for Go With The Heat. Go to GoWithTheHeat.com. You can find a link straight to the channel. You'll be able to play it on your Apple TV if you want to, I guess. <laughs> Pe- people do that. <laughs> <laughs> also, go to support. We would love to have your support. Step one of support. Review the show. Go to your podcatcher platform of choice. Review the show. Give it five sunflowers, four pickles. Whatever <laughs> the rating system is, give us the highest rating. <laughs> Don't leave a review. No one reads the reviews. Just talk about how much you love Bob Marley in the review. Just go ahead and do that inside of there. Everything will be just fine. Also, be sure to check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. We have a ton of things we would love to do with the show. Check that out and find out all the ways that we want to grow the show and all the new cool things that we want to do. Patreon.com slash go with the heat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed the show and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals.